We're nearing the end of this uh, series, Rebuilding Life Tools, from Ezra and Nehemiah. We have two Sundays to go and six chapters of the Bible. And uh, my math teacher always said, you're going to use math someday, and I think she's right. That means we've got to do three chapters per Sunday. And uh, so that's a lot of material to cover. Now, these life lessons that are in these chapters are incredibly rich, and I would encourage you to uh, take some notes and go back later this week with your notes and uh, revisit these passages. And if, if you do that, I wouldn't be surprised of all, at all if the Lord uh, moved in your heart to speak to you about some things going on in your life, because I don't know what's going to happen to you this week. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen to you either. Uh, so it wouldn't be good and wise of us to stay connected to Him and apply the lessons that we learned perhaps on Sunday throughout the week. And so if you have your Bible, uh, get ready because we're going to move quickly. And as the great theologian Jerry Reed once said, we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. I'm pretty sure he was a theologian. Maybe. I know he had a song about Moses. I know that. But anyway, Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Bible and the verses should appear behind the screens, or on the screens behind me. Here's the background to this passage. Uh, God's people Israel had been overtaken some years before by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And uh, so he took the majority of the people away into captivity. Well, then Babylon, later on, got captured by the Persians. If you know your world history, you already knew that. And the Persians allowed the Jews to go back home and to rebuild their temple so they could worship God, and to rebuild, rebuild their entire city of Jerusalem, their capital city, so that they could have a safe place to worship God. And, of course, continue to pay tribute to the kings of uh, Persia. And, uh, and so that's what we have, and we're now in the 8th chapter of the book of Nehemiah. And the people have finally rebuilt the walls, the temple's rebuilt, and they're gathering together for the very first time in any of their lives, in all likelihood, to worship God again. It had been decades, decades before, since the uh, children of God had been able to worship God together like this. So this was a very momentous occasion, a very uh, spiritual occasion, a very emotional occasion. And so we read in chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, these words. And going back to part of chapter 7. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people gathered together at the square in front of the water gate. They asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had given Israel. On the first day of the seventh month, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding. While he was facing the square in front of the water gate, he read out of it from daybreak until noon before the men, women, and those who could understand. All the people listened attentively to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a high wooden platform made for this purpose. Mattathiah, Shema, and Anna, excuse me, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maasiah stood beside him on his right. To his left were... Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Hashbanadah, Badanah, rather, Zechariah, and Meshulam. I don't want to offend him by mispronouncing his name. Verse 5, Ezra opened the book in full view of the people, since he was elevated above everyone. As he opened it, all the people stood up. Now let's stop here for just a minute. The people stood for the reading of Scripture. Why? Because Scripture is the very Word of God. When God speaks, it is appropriate to stand in His presence. Can you imagine standing before a king, and when he speaks, you sit down? I mean, that would be offensive, wouldn't it? That would be offensive to the king. This event in Ezra's day serves as the origin as to why I and so many other churches today ask you to stand when God's Word is read uninterrupted. The reason we're not standing right now is because I am interrupting 
the reading of God's Word with my exposition. Exposition means that I expose the meaning of God's Word to God's people. I explain God's Word. And you have to understand, of course, that my words are not God's Word. Only God's Word is God's Word. My words are an explanation or an exposition of God's Word, and my words are only true to the degree that I properly explain God's Word, and God's Word is always true. Verse 6, Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and with their hands uplifted, all the people said, Amen, Amen. Then they knelt low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Look at the postures that God's people took. They stood to hear God's word being read. They lifted their hands when God's name was blessed. And then they bowed their knees and bowed their faces to the ground to worship God. I don't ever want you to get overly concerned about the postures taken by other people when they worship God. But I do want you to understand this. The worship of God should be something that every part of us is involved in because we are created in the image of God. And so when you worship God, you can close your eyes, you can bow your head, you can bow your knees, you can stand you can lift your eyes, you can lift your head, you can lift your hands. The Bible even has incidents where people beat their chest in sorrow. You can cover your face in shame. You can wear sackcloth. You can wear ashes. You can even lie prostrate on the ground. The posture that the Lord leads you to do is something that is very important because it is an expression of your worship of Him, of your relationship to Him at the time. Verses 7 and 8, we read these words, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Masaiah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah, who were Levites, explained the law to the people as they stood in their places. They read out of the book of the law of God, translating and giving the meaning so the people could understand what was being read. This is what I do. This is, this is uh, what I do that I was explaining earlier. This is the exposition of the Word of God. The exposition of the Word of God is a very holy task. When God's people are gathered like we are today and the exposition of God's Word is occurring, this is a holy thing that is happening because God may be doing business with somebody in their hearts. In fact, if, if someone is unable or unwilling to properly expose God's Word to God's people gathered, that person cannot be a pastor. It is a qualification. To be a pastor, to be able to teach the Word of God to God's people. That person may be a fine servant of God, may be a gifted servant of God. That person may be a, a prayer warrior, but being a pastor means teaching God's Word to God's people. You are the flock of God, and it is food for your soul. 1 Timothy 3.2 lists as one of the qualifications of being a pastor as this, being able to teach. That very same chapter lists the qualifications of, of deacons as well. And the ability to teach God's Word is not listed as a qualification of being a deacon. There are some very fine teachers of God's Word who happen to be deacons, but being able to teach God's Word is not a qualification to become a deacon. It is, however, to become a pastor. And so God takes very seriously the exposition of His Word because it is for the benefit of His people who He loves. Verse 9 of chapter 8. 
They read out of the book of the law of God, translating and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was, uh, what was uh, read. That's verse 8, verse 9. Nehemiah, the governor. Ezra, the, scri- the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to all of them, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. Why were God's people weeping? It's because this is the first time that so many of them had ever even heard the Word of God. They'd lived their entire lives without an ability to really worship God. They didn't have copies of their Bible up on their shelves at home. The only way they would hear the Word of God is to come together as God's people and someone read it to them. Someone explain it to them. This was the very first time that so many of them had ever had this opportunity And as they read these words, they began to realize, I believe, what they were missing out on their entire lives. And they began to weep. But this day was not to be a day of weeping. It was to be a day of celebration, not a day of sorrow. So we read in verses 10 and following, Then he said to them, Go and eat what is rich, drink what is sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared, since today is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. What a wonderful phrase. What a wonderful phrase. Verse 11, And the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, since today is holy. Don't grieve. Then all the people began to eat and drink, send portions, and have a great celebration. I think they were Baptists. Because they had understood the words that were explained to them. Verse 13, on the second day, the family heads of all the people, along with the priests and Levites, assembled before the scribe Ezra to study the words of the law. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the Israelites should dwell in shelters during the festival of the seventh month. In tents and tabernacles, they called it, and booths. This is the festival of booths or the festival of tents or tabernacles. And they they read this and they discovered, hey, we should be doing this. And, And so they began to do it. Verse 15, so they proclaimed... And spread this news throughout their towns and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out into the hill country and bring, bra- bring back uh, branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make shelters, just as it is written. The people went out, brought back branches, and made shelters for themselves on each of their rooftops and courtyards, the court of the house of God, the square by the water gate, and the square by the Ephraim gate. The whole community that had returned from exile made shelters and lived in them. The Israelites had not celebrated like this from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day. And there was tremendous joy. Ezra read out of the book of the law of God every day, from the first day to the last. The Israelites celebrated the festival for seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. I absolutely love this. I love this, and I'll tell you why. Do you understand what God's people did? If churches throughout America and throughout the world would simply hang on to this one principle, it would be revolutionary. Here's what they did. They discovered something that God said to do in His Word, and they did it. That's it. They didn't form a committee to study it. They didn't say, well, we've never done it that way before. They didn't hesitate. God's Word said it, and they did it. It's that simple. It's really that simple. When we do that, God blesses in in incredible ways. And so for Israel in that day, it meant for them that they celebrated the festival of booths, of tabernacles, of tents, of shelters, whatever you want to call it. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. 
birthday. Fast forward a few, a few weeks here. On the 24th day of this month, the Israelites assembled. They were fasting, wearing sackcloth, and had put dust on their heads. These are all signs of mourning, signs of confession, signs of repentance. Okay, They're about to have a national day of confession. Verse 2, those of Israelite descent separated themselves from all foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their ancestors. While they stood in their places, they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a fourth of the day. I think this means from like, if you were to take sunrise to sunset, a fourth of the day would be about three hours. They, they read from the book of the law for a fourth of the day, and spent another fourth of the day in confession and worship of the Lord their God. Jeshua, Bani, Cadmiel, Shabaniah, Buni, Sherebiah, Bani, and Kaniah stood on the raised platform built for the Levites and cried out loudly to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Cadmiel, Bani, Hashbaniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shabaniah, and Pathiah, Pethahiah said, stand up. They instructed the people. They said, stand up. Blessed be the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. And this is their prayer. Blessed be your glorious name. And may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. And in the rest of this chapter, they pray in a very unique way. What they do in this prayer is they recount the story of God and man. They retell the history of God leading up to their day. And so in verse 6, they talk about the Lord's creation. You, Lord, are the only God. You created the heavens, the highest heavens, with all their stars, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, you give life to all of them. And all the stars of heaven worship you. In verse 7 and 8, they talk about how the Lord chose Abraham. You, the Lord, are the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and changed his name to Abraham. You found his heart faithful in your sight and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, Hethites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Girgashites to give it to his descendants. You have fulfilled your promise, for you are righteous. In verses 9 and 10, they talk about how the Lord defeated Pharaoh of Egypt. You saw the oppression of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. You perform signs and wonders against Pharaoh, all his officials, and all the people of his land. For you knew how arrogantly they treated our ancestors. You made a name for yourself that endures to this day. In verse 11, they talk about how the Lord divided the seas of the Red Sea. You divided the sea before them, and they crossed through it. On dry ground, you hurled their pursuers into the depths like a stone into raging waters. Verse 12, they talk about how the Lord led God's people. You led them with a pillar of cloud by day and with a pillar of fire by night to eliminate the way they should go. In verses 13 and 14, they talk about how the Lord gave them the law. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke to them from heaven. You gave them impartial ordinances, reliable instructions, and good statutes and commands. You revealed your holy Sabbath to them and gave them command statutes, statutes and instruction through your servant Moses. Then in verse 15, they talk about how the Lord provided for them in the wilderness. You provided bread from heaven for their hunger. You brought them water from the rock for their thirst. You told them to go in and possess the land you had sworn to give them. In verses 16 through 21, they talk about how God, even though they were unfaithful, God did not abandon Israel. Verse 16, but our ancestors acted arrogantly. 
They became stiff-necked and did not listen to your commands. They refused to listen and did not remember your wonders you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in faithful love, and you did not abandon them. Even after they had cast an image of a calf for themselves and said, This is your God who brought you out of Egypt. And they had committed terrible blasphemies. You did not abandon them in the wilderness because of your great compassion. During the day, the pillar of cloud never turned away from them, guiding them on their journey. And during the night, the pillar of fire illuminated the way they should go. You sent your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths, and you gave them water for their thirst. You provided for them in the wilderness 40 years, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. That's a miracle right there. In verses 22 through 25, they talk about how the Lord gave them a land. You gave them kingdoms and peoples and established boundaries for them. They took possession of the land of King Sihon of Heshbon and of the land of King Og of Bashan. You multiplied their descendants like the stars of the sky and brought them to the land. You told their ancestors to go in and possess. So their descendants went in and possessed the land. You subdued the Canaanites who inhabited the land before them and handed their kings and the surrounding peoples over to them to do as they pleased with them. They captured fortified cities and fertile land and took possession of well-supplied houses, cisterns cut out of rock, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. They ate, were filled, became prosperous, and delighted in your great goodness. But they slipped away again. And so in this prayer, they talk about how the Lord disciplined them. Verse 26 But they were disobedient, and they rebelled against you. They flung your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who warned them in order to turn them back to you. They committed terrible blasphemies. So you handed them over to their enemies who oppressed them in their time of distress, and they cried out to you. And you heard from heaven. In your abundant compassion, you gave them deliverers, those are the judges, who rescued them from the power of their enemies. But as soon as they had relief, they again did what was evil in your sight, so you abandoned them to the power of their enemies, who dominated them. When they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven and rescued them many times in your compassion. You warned them to turn back to your law, but they acted arrogantly and would not obey your commands. They sinned against your ordinances, which a person will live by if he does them. They stubbornly resisted, stiffened their necks, and would not obey. You were patient with them for many years, and your spirit warned them through your prophets, but they would not listen. Therefore, you handed them over to the surrounding people. In verse 31, they retell the story how God did not destroy them. However, in your abundant compassion, you did not destroy them or abandon them. For you are a gracious and compassionate God. So now, verse 32, now they finally get to their prayer. And they confess their sin. So now, our God, the great, mighty, and awe-inspiring God who keeps His gracious covenant, do not view lightly all the hardships that have afflicted us, our kings and leaders, our priests and prophets, our ancestors and all your people from the days of the Assyrian kings until today. You are righteous concerning all that has happened to us because you have acted faithfully while we have acted wickedly. Our kings, leaders, priests, and ancestors did not obey your law or listen to your commands and warnings you gave them. 
when they were in your kingdom with your abundant goodness that you gave them and in, and in the spacious and fertile land you set before them, they would not serve you or turn from their wicked ways. Here we are today, slaves in the land you gave our ancestors so that they could enjoy its fruit and its goodness. Here we are, slaves in it. Its abundant harvest goes to the kings you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and our livestock as they please. We are in great distress. Listen, I don't know what exactly you may be going through. You may be like the Israelites here and and find yourself in your life, whatever circumstances you're in, to be in great distress. Maybe it's not that way right now for you. Maybe, Maybe things are pretty good. But however it is, whether things are good or things are bad, when you pray to the Lord, we can learn a lesson from their prayer. If you don't know how to pray, if you don't know where to begin, one of the things that you can do is you can tell the story of God in your prayers as you talk to God. For example, if you're in need of physical healing, you can think back in the Bible as to how God brought physical healing to different people. You take uh, Naaman in the Old Testament, healed of leprosy. How God brought healing to Naaman, a Gentile, because Naaman was faithful to do what the prophet had said. You could talk about that in your prayer to God. You could talk about blind Bartimaeus or or remember the, the man who was lowered down through the roof to be able to just be with Jesus and maybe Jesus could heal that paralytic and Jesus did. You could... Recount those stories to God in your prayers. Or maybe it's not physical healing that you need. Maybe it's you need God to provide. Whether it's financial or some other kind of provision, you really need to see God's provision or else you're just not going to make it. And so you can look back into the scriptures and you can see how God had provided for his faithful people throughout the years. You can look back at Abraham and Isaac up on the mountain, and Abraham is getting ready to sacrifice his own son, and yet God provided a ram, didn't he? You can look at how Israel, as they prayed here, went through the desert wilderness, and God provided every single day for 40 years manna from heaven, water. God provided all the time for his people, and God still provides. You you could recount the, the time when Jesus told his followers not to worry about the provisions. Why? Because God provides for the flowers in the field. Those beautiful little dandelions in your lawn. God provides for them. Don't you think you're worth more than a weed? Of course you are. God provides for the birds of the sky. A bird, does, a single bird, a worthless bird, does not fall to the ground that God doesn't know about it. Don't you know that God will provide for you? You can recount those stories, recount those teachings. And if you, you're not really sure about everything that God has done in the Bible, you can always in your prayer retell the story of what God has done for you what he's done for your life. Whether you've walked with God for many years or not, God has been there every step of the way providing for you, blessing you. So identify those blessings. Pray them back to God. Well, so then after they said we were in great distress, they decided it's time for us to make a covenant with God. And so all of the people got together and they signed a document indicating a binding agreement that they would serve the Lord together. Verse 38 of chapter 9, we read this. In view of all this, they say, we are making a binding agreement and writing on a sealed document containing the names of our leaders, Levites, and priests. Those whose seals were on the document were the governor Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, and Zedekiah, Sariah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Pashur, Amariah, Malkijah, Hattush, Shebaniah, Malak, Harim, Miramoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Ginnathan, Baruch, Meshulam, Abijah, 
Mazamon, Maaziah, Bagiah, and Shemaiah, these were the priests. The Levites were Joshua, Jeshua, son of Azaniah, Benoi, the sons of Henadad, Cadmiel, and their brothers, Shebaniah, Hodiah, Kalida, Peliah, Hanan, Micah, Rehob, Hashabiah, Zachor, Sherebiah, Shebaniah, Hodiah, Bani, and Beninu. The heads of the people were Parash, Pahath Moab, Elam, Zatu, Bani, Buni, Asgad, Bebai, Adonijah, Bigvi, Adin, Atar, Hezekiah, Azur, Hodiah, Hashem, Bazai, Harif, Anathoth, Nebai, Magpiash, Meshulam, Hezir, Meshazabel, Zadok, Jadua, Pelatiah, Hanan, Aniah, Hosea, Hanani, Hashub, Halohesh, Pilha, Shobek, Rehum, Hashabna, Maasiah, Ahijah, Hanan, Anan, Malak, Harim, Bana, the rest of the people, the priests, Levites, gatekeepers, singers, and temple servants, along with their wives, sons, daughters, everyone who is able to understand and who has separated themselves from the surrounding peoples to obey the law of God, join with their noble brothers and commit themselves with a sworn oath to follow the law of God given through God's servant Moses and to obey carefully all the commands, ordinances, stat and statutes of the Lord our God and hear specifically what they vowed to do. Verse 30. We will not give our daughters in marriage to the surrounding peoples and will not take their daughters as wives for our sons. When the surrounding peoples bring merchandise or any kind of grain to sell on the Sabbath day, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or a holy day. We will also leave the land uncultivated in the seventh year and will cancel every debt. We will impose the following commands on ourselves. To give an eighth of an ounce of silver yearly for the service of the house of our God, the bread displayed before the Lord, the daily grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbath and new moon offerings, the appointed festivals, the holy things, the sin offerings to atone for Israel, and for all the work of the house of our God. We have cast lots among the priests, Levites, and people for the donation of wood by our ancestral families at the appointed times each year. They are to bring the wood to our God's house to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law. Verse 35, we will bring the first fruits of our land and of every fruit tree to the Lord's house, year by year. We will also bring the firstborn of our sons and our livestock as prescribed by the law. And we will bring the firstborn of our herds and flocks to the house of our Lord, of our God, to the priests who serve in our God's house. We will bring a loaf from our first batch of dough to the priests to the store, at the storerooms of the house of our God. We will also bring the first fruits of our grain offerings of every fruit tree and of the new wine and fresh oil, a tenth of our land's produce belongs to the Levites. For the Levites are to collect the one-tenth offering in all our agricultural towns. A priest from Aaron's descendants is to accompany the Levites when they collect the tenth. And the Levites are to take a tenth of this offering to the storerooms of the treasury in the house of our God. For the Israelites and the Levites are to bring the contributions of grain, new wine, and fresh oil to the storerooms where the articles of the sanctuary are kept and where the priests who minister are, along with the gatekeepers and singers, we will not neglect the house of our God. They were serious about their obedience. They had gone through the law. They saw what the law of God required, both in tithes, which is always an agricultural offering in the Bible, and all of the other offerings, and they said, we're going to do it all. We're going to obey God in all of this. We will not neglect the house of our God. Because when you neglect the house of God, you are by extension neglecting your own faith in God. And so the people of that day made a covenant with God to do certain things that they had, because they had trusted in God. They had belief in their hearts. And listen to me. If you today are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
If you're a follower of Him, then you likewise have made a covenant with God. And in every covenant, there are responsibilities on both sides. The responsibility that you have as a follower of Jesus is this. Follow Him. That's it. That's all you have to do. Follow Him. Go where He leads you. Do what He says. But follow Him. Him. Every day, follow Him. That's your responsibility. God's responsibility toward you is to forgive you, to stay with you, to love you, to pick you up when you stumble, to guide you, to never leave you or forsake you, to make His Spirit dwell in in you to give you eternal life and so much more there's so much more that God has done in his covenant with us I don't know about you but to me that's a pretty favorable covenant all I have to do is follow Jesus and I receive all of that and more I'm in I'm going to do that. I'm in on that covenant. Today, if you're not yet a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, that covenant that I just described is available to you. Being a part of it is as easy as A, B, and C. First of all, admit that you're a sinner. You can't come to God without admitting who you really are, and you're a sinner. Secondly, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Believe that He is what the Bible says that He is. That that He is the eternal Son of God. That He came to this earth, lived a life without sin. He died on a cross to pay for your sins and mine. That He rose from the grave to give us eternal life and He's coming back. And He's going to judge this world. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally commit to follow Him. Commit your entire life to follow Him. And if you're willing to do that, He'll receive you. You can have that covenant. You can have all the blessings that I just described. All you have to do is follow Jesus.